Welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multimillionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it, and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are joined by Gleb Spursky. And Gleb offers coaching and consulting services for wise decision-making. He helps people, organizations, and our society as a whole avoid disaster through evidence-based decision-making and emotional and social intelligence. He works at the intersection of psychology, behavioral economics, and cognitive neuroscience, applying theoretical frameworks drawn from these fields to historical and political case studies. In simpler terms, his specific research is on effective decision-making, goal achievement, emotional, and social intelligence. He's published over 25 peer-reviewed articles in academic venues, as well as in a couple of books. He's currently a tenure-track professor at The Ohio State University in the History of Behavioral Science Department and an active member in, of the Decision Sciences Collaborative. I asked him to join us here today to help us all understand the decision-making process and make better ones for our lives, our families, and our businesses. So, Gleb, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, and thanks so much for having me on the show, Daryl. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it is an honor and pleasure. It was a good decision, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like that. that's an interesting, I mean, it's a really broad and wide topic, but obviously, I mean, we make decisions all day, every day, and there's so many data points to take into a single solitary decision. I'm curious, before you even got into this field of research, what led you on this path? What did you do? Did you, like, yeah, like as a child, was 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 science a big thing in your household when you grew up? Like, where does, yeah, where does this come from? Yeah, no, it's not a thing about my household. It's more like the society and the people around me. In fact, I saw my parents making some pretty bad decisions. Yeah, I think we all have, but I mean, they're just people, yeah. right? So. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I saw that and I saw just people around me making decisions that uh, just turned out so poorly. And also the process that they went through to make their decisions was really problematic. A lot of people do things just like going with their guts and not thinking about all the factors, the real long-term future of their decisions. I mean, people make decisions that they kind of in the moment know they will regret, but they still make them. I mean, this is why we take a second piece of chocolate cake, even though we, you know, no, we shouldn't. Or, you know, why so many people you know, fall into gambling or alcoholism or they buy, I mean, people who are buying homes in the two, 2007, you know, turned out to be a pretty bad decision. People were very optimistic about the house prices going up. So anyway, as I was growing up, I saw people making really bad decisions and I saw society making bad decisions in terms of politics. And I really, that frustrated me a lot. And I really wanted to help people avoid that. And this is why I went into the history of behavioral science to study decision making. This is why I do consulting and speaking and training on these topics. And I also founded a nonprofit called Intentional Insights at intentionalinsights.org to popularize the research on decision making for a broad audience. So it's kind of the activities that I do to help folks make better decisions and avoid disasters for poor decisions. Mm. So now I want to, this is a great, I mean, for me, this is really pertinent. I mean, obviously, I've got a life, <laughs> like anybody listening to this call, and I can look back and I can you know, think of good and bad decisions that I've made in my past. I think I've fared fairly well overall, but also what's also very pertinent is now I'm recently taking care of three teenagers, and it's interesting because I forget what it's like when I was younger too, and it's interesting for me to just see some of the things that go on and the decisions that are made, and so it's just interesting for me because it's actually a very un fresh like just the whole decision-making process and like influences mm -hmm. for it and that. So anyway, it's just a really interesting thing. Now, most people just react on emotion, right? Like when you go to make a decision, it's something that just, just you, you your instinct. A lot of people is, yes. yeah, most people just let their reptilian brain, their monkey brain, just do whatever it wants and kind of impulses, which I mean, it, 
grew our civilization to where we are today. So what's so wrong with that? <laughs> sure. Great question. So we have two, let me go into the science on this topic. We have two systems of thinking. One, which is called system one or colloquially the autopilot system is our emotional brain. That's the intuitions. That's our gut reactions, the lizard brain, whatever you want to call it. Don't call it the subconscious. That's not actually the accurate term for it because the subconscious implies that we can't interact with it. Mm. Well, research, recent research shows that we can interact with it. Mm, good so point. We can manage that. So that's not, that's not a good way of terming it. The autopilot system is what I strongly prefer to call it because that really gets at what it is. It's our automatic, habitual, quick, intuitive, emotional decision making. Mm. Now, research shows it's much more powerful than our conscious, reflective, deliberative system, which is called system two or the intentional system. System one evolved to protect us from saber-toothed tigers and gives us the flight or fight response. Right. So that is the intuitive system. The intentional system does, is much weaker. It evolved for us to survive as human beings in social groups. So it evolved much later after we need it. And so the intentional system takes about a second to turn on, whereas the autopilot system takes a couple of milliseconds. It takes effort. It takes a lot of conscious reflection and concentration to turn on. So let's give an example of you know, when it is useful, the autopilot system. The autopilot system is quite useful when you need to jump out of the way of a moving car. Right. You, know, you don't want to be waiting for there. Right. But you know, the flight or fright response is not really useful when you're dealing with your boss who is giving you criticism on your job performance. <laughs> you know, Punch him in the nose. The, yeah. It's exactly. So I hear you and I think you're the aggressive type. I'm also the aggressive type. I'm the, fl I'm the fight response. You know, Punch him in the nose is exactly the response that I get. A lot of people have more of the flight response, which is stick your fingers in your ears and shout, Walk la, away. la, la, I yeah, can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that's the flight response. Now, the intentional, not the autopilot response, the intentional response is incorporating your boss's criticism into your performance and then improving your performance going forward. Now, how easy is that when you do that? That takes a lot of effort. Right. That's hard. It's willpower. That's Yes, exactly. Willpower, energy, focus, concentration. That's when you feel your intentional system at work. So that's what's wrong with our autopilot system, basically. When you don't want to go with your gut, there are a whole series of situations that have especially to do with making major decisions and with social interactions. When it's bad, bad, bad to go with your gut, now, again, going with your gut is not a bad thing in most situations. When you're driving your car, you want to, in almost all cases, go with your gut. But when you're dealing with people, that may lead you in some bad directions. And when you're making major decisions, that may lead you to some bad directions. So we can talk about both of those, but I want to just clarify the science on the two systems of thinking and why it may sometimes not be a good idea to go with your gut. Right. Now, obviously, we can understand that. And rationally, I can understand that. And intellectually, I can grasp it. But how much control is our people able to develop over this sort of thing? Like if it's an automatic system, isn't it auto automatic? It's actually not automatic. It's called autopilot. Oh, sorry, autopilot. It's not, right. It's not automatic. And it's not the subconscious. This is why I was drawing the distinction between the, su the subconscious and the autopilot. We can choose to be mindful. We can choose to be intentional. You know, the subconscious implies that we can't reach it. That's what the Freudian old kind of uh, dynamic, that's not how things work. We can actually, research shows that we can retrain our system of thinking. In the short term, we can use willpower to suppress autopilot responses. But that takes a lot of energy and effort. In the long term, we can retrain our mental habits so that we automatically don't cringe when the boss gives us criticism so that we say, oh, hey, thank you for that useful, criti constructive, critical feedback. Let me work on improving myself through that. That's a mental habit that can be developed. It will take a lot of effort. It's uh, colloquially, it's known as, so there are two metaphors. There's a metaphor for the autopilot system and the intentional system. The autopilot system is like the elephant. It's a huge beast that's intuitive and emotional. And the autopilot and the intentional system is like the rider on top of the mm. elephant, trying to ride the elephant. Now, in the long term, 
you can certainly guide the elephant to where you want to go. In the short term, the elephant may very easily stampede right. away. And just controls. trample over your face and leave you there. Exactly. <laughs> yes, that's when you actually do punch your boss in the face. That right. happens. <laughs> and you're like, ah, oh, that felt good. And you walk away. And you get a reward for that, too. You get a reward for following your impulses a lot of time, which right. is what what causes part of the problem, right? Because you're trying to recondition a behavior, but you're you're – you're rewarding yourself for doing what you don't want to, what you shouldn't, what you know you shouldn't be doing. Right. So the retraining takes a lot of stuff, like you're saying, rewarding. So it's setting up deliberate positive reinforcement for yourself for doing the thing that you want to be doing. So it's kind of habit modification. We have behavioral habits. How do we behave? And we have mental habits. How do we think? Every time that you think that, hey, that was criticism, let me praise myself for dealing well with that criticism. Let me eat a piece of chocolate for, you know, whatever rewards you set up for dealing well with that criticism. Let me pat myself on the back, you know, when uh, I deal well with criticism. That's the way that you set up good mental habits and retrain your autopilot system to using your intentional system. So this is the trick, using your rider to retrain your elephant, using your auto intentional system to retrain your autopilot. Now, I love the concept my question is, what's the time frame for the reward? So if I do what I'm supposed to do, there's a cue. I, th- I forget where I heard this. I, I do apologize for whoever, did, but it's cue, habit, reward. That's the three structures of training a habit. And so you get the cue, you do the habit you want to do. How long is the delay, for, like the reward? Or is it just that as long as you're aware? Can I reward myself tomorrow for what I do today? And as long as I'm cognitively aware of it, it will help retrain the elephant or... So there are a couple of things. It is best to reward yourself as quickly as possible because you get your autopilot system responds. It it doesn't respond very well to future orientation. So it's best to reward yourself as quickly as possible. And you can do that very quickly with, uh, you know, pat on the back, physical or mental kind of, hey, I did a good job here. Now, that's one. Second, you can, another way of doing it is, journaling. So journaling, you come home after a day or in the morning, whenever you want to structure it, and you reflect on your past activities. What did I do well? What can I improve on? And that's a perfect time to build things in. That is less immediate for the elephant, for the autopilot system, but it's still quite effective because it gives you time to deliberately, reflectively focus on it. And you give yourself you know, positive reinforcement that still works. But it's best, the most effective system is a combination of both, giving yourself a quick back, pat on the back or eating a piece of chocolate or whatever in the moment and then reflecting on it more deliberately later onward. At the end of the day. So yes. that's so funny because I'm a big fan and I don't really get anything for this, but something called the five minute journal. And I've been a big fan. It was passed on by a friend of mine. Yeah. And that's, you know, it does the gratitude in the morning, three goals, your own affirmation, whatever you think. And then at the end of the day, three things great about the day and then how you could have made it better. And that's, I guess, incorporating this. That would be a great way to retrain the elephant is just end of day reflection. What was good about today and how could I have made it better? Absolutely. No, that's that's one specific technique of journaling. That's quite good. There's a whole bunch of other techniques uh, that you can use. But definitely seeing, incorporating into your current journaling something like what kind of mental habits do I want to develop and how can I, how can I see myself developing them? What did I do this day that showed that I was developing these mental habits? You know, where did I slip? And kind of acknowledging yourself, hey, it's okay that I slipped, but noticing that I slipped here and here and here. And I can do better in these ways in the future. So, I mean, it sounds like humans as a species, we're pretty smart. I mean, we put people on the moon, whether you're a believer or not. We've created flights. Even we've created technology like this where we can be in vast distances, physically impossible to communicate on. But we've created technology that allows it and now allows us to share our conversation with people all around the world. So humans were – so it almost sounds like just awareness. If you are aware of what you're doing – in some way, shape, or form, you'll na- if there's any sort of feedback mechanism, you will adjust as a person because you're not broken by default, right? Like there's never been a misshaped wave or a misshaped cloud or – yeah, a misshaped cloud or a wave. So generally speaking, people are self-correcting organisms as long as there's a feedback loop is what I'm getting from you. 
people people can be self-correcting, but only if they're aware of their flaws. Mm. Because people tend to not be aware of their flaws. I'll give you an example. I'm an optimist. Now, what does that mean? That means that I tend to see things, I tend to be risk blind. I tend to see things as more likely to happen than they will positive things. And this is a failure. This is a problem within myself because I tend to take too many risks and make mistakes based on these risks. And I tend to think that things will turn out well and I don't plan enough resources for when things will go badly. You know, not planning enough time for activities, not planning enough money for various investments. This is a problem for the business that I run. This is a problem for me as a person, for my relationships. You know, when I write an email to someone, I don't think about all the ways it can be misinterpreted. Right. So I have to, if I didn't know that about myself, if I didn't know about good decision-making habits, and that this, this, is a, this is a type of cognitive bias. So a bias is, you know, not a gender or ethnicity thing, but cognitive bias are mental habits that are problematic for us. Mm, that's so, a great way to put it. Yep. So it's called the cognitive bias. You can look it up in Wikipedia. There's a list of over 100 cognitive biases, and this is cutting-edge research. So more cognitive biases are added kind of every month. So one of these is the optimism bias, and it can be harmful if you're not aware of it. So, you know, it can still be harmful if you're aware of it. So something that I do is I know that I'm optimistic. I have learned that about myself and I work hard to correct for it. You know, if I think that, oh, I'm going to go get to that meeting, you know, so I'm going to leave uh, 30 minutes in advance. I'm like, no, I should leave 45 minutes. In right, advance. right, right. You're <laughs> yeah. like, I'm being hopeful. So, yes, exactly. So, so oh, pessimism, gosh. by the way, is a similar sort of thing. Pessimism bias. People don't take enough advantage of opportunities when they're pessimistic and they don't take enough risks when they're pessimistic. So that's another sort of cognitive bias. There's a list of over 100, and I recommend your listeners go and check them out because that will be really helpful. Right, right, right. You also have a list of tips for people that are if, – if this is intriguing and people are interested in, in, a, in a, I guess a tip sheet, to, to a worksheet to help them along with their decision-making process, you have something for them, right? Yes. So I have a tip sheet on helping people make significant decisions. So that – you know, basically, there are, I told you that there's like something over 100 biases, and there are a number of techniques to address them. Perhaps the most effective one is to put numbers on your decisions. So when you're making any significant decision, when you want to purchase a car, when you want to purchase a house, when you want to hire an employee, when you want to decide whether to invest in a certain product or not, or a business collaboration, or make a merger with another company, companies bring me in to talk about this stuff all the time. And so what I do is work with them to put numbers on their options. Let's say they're thinking about uh, which of three business collaborators to work with, business companies to work with. Then they make qua quantif characterizations of various decisions. You know, this one has, so let's say experience, uh, credibility um, in the marketplace, respect, costs, and so on. They weigh these how important each one is, and then they evaluate each of the options on each of the qualities that will make the decision, and then they multiply it out. That really helps you get rid of a lot of bad decisions and a lot of cognitive biases. And so I have a tip sheet on that that people can email me at gleb at intentionalinsights.org. That's G-L-E-B at intentionalinsights.org, and I'll send them a free copy of the tip sheet. That's so awesome. Usually paid, but they have to say that they heard me on Best Business Podcast. So if they say they heard me on Best Business Podcast, email me, and I will send them a free copy of that tip sheet. Perfect. Awesome. So now I have a couple of questions about this. First, as far as putting numbers next to the decisions, I think when you said that, something clicked for me because for time management, I'm a big fan of Pomodoro's, and I'm a big fan of identifying my top three priorities for the day. And it's funny because I'll write down all the things I have to do and I make the top three. But when I have to pick one of the top three, it just it's it's tough to do. It's like you avoid it because then you're commit like it's like a commitment thing. You're like, then I'm committed because that's the most important. And I don't know why that is. But when you said that, it was just so clear. Again, it's that whole awareness thing. Like when you're really aware, then suddenly everything else, you know, just falls to the background. And then you really focus on what's what's priority. You said something though about multiplying it out. What do you mean by that? Sure. So let's say you have 
uh, free options. Let's say you have option one, a business collaborator. Uh, let's say Jackie works for a multinational company and you're considering using her as a supplier. And you have two other options. And you're considering things like cost, reputation, and so on. So you put numbers on how important cost is to you, the cost of this thing, anywhere from one to 10. One is least important to 10 is most important. Quality of products, one is least important to 10, most important, and so on. Expertise in the matter of from one to 10. Then you rate Jackie on each of these qualities. So let's say Jackie is 10 on reputation, three on cost, and eight on quality. So let's say then you multiply out your ratings of Jackie by how important each of these things to you, by your ratings of each of these numbers. And therefore, you get a clear number for the value of Jackie and her company to you. Mm, 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 mm. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Which is a very methodical, logical way to make decisions. Now, exactly. So that, that's, that's where you turn on and very effectively use your intentional system. It's only meant to be used for significant decisions. You know, you, you're not going to use it to decide Which, what to yeah. eat in, for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. You're only going to use it, you know, for something like which of these three candidates do I want to hire? Again, which car do I want to buy? Which house do I want to buy? Which city do I want to move to? Anything that's a significant decision where you have multiple factors, that's a good time to use this significant decision-making tip sheet. So now I want to touch on another point because we identified that people generally are highly intelligent and that if there's a feedback loop where they're aware of their flaws, they will self-correct because generally speaking, people want to get along with others. They want to be successful. They want to, you know, they want to fit in. They want to be good at what they do. How does social influence, how does like a social context influence that? The people you live with, the friends you hang out with, uh, the city you're in, even, even just, well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm known for sometimes throwing seven questions at someone, so I'm just going to stop there. But how does, how does that influence our decision-making process? So our social context is quite influential. There is research showing that network effects, well, this is what's something that's called a network effect. So who are the friends around us are, that strongly influences the kind of decisions we make because we are creatures that are strongly motivated by our peers. So social status and reputation and peer influence are powerful in shaping us into who we are. Uh, for example, research shows that uh, something like, I don't remember the exact details, but for smoking, if we have people around us quitting smoking, we have a substantially higher likelihood of quitting smoking. This is, has nothing to do with anything else. It's just if our peer network quits smoking. And the same thing vice versa. If they start smoking, we have a significantly more likelihood of starting smoking. People, so this is causatory. So this is a cause. It's not correlation. They are quitting smoking or starting to smoke causes us to do that. Similar things have been shown for other activity for other qualities like weight gain or weight loss. So we are strongly influenced by the people who we are around. So I make a deliberate effort to surround myself with people who I want to be like and who I think will have a good influence on me because I know in a hundred subconscious ways they are influencing my autopilot system to make certain decisions. So I'm like, okay, you know, because I know this about decision-making, I'm going to surround myself with people who will influence me in positive ways. So and that's is, a very important strategy. Is that the only way we can really safeguard ourselves from that? Especially, I mean, especially because if you think of younger, like I said, I got teenagers in that. A lot of them, like they're forced in certain social situations, a classroom, and they can't choose who the people they are in class with. Is there tiers of this? Are there any ways that you can buffer yourself against that? Because I know there's a ton of people that maybe have relatives or a spouse or something like that. Is there any, like, what do you do if you're if there's people you can't disassociate from that you feel that you have to, and I'm not necessarily trying to imply that anyone sure, I've sure. mentioned, but just in general, because, you know, in an office, where you work next to someone, yeah. So we can make a deliberate effort with our intentional system to say that, hey, this is not a person I want to model myself on. So you can do that, but it takes willpower. It takes energy out of your other reserves. Research shows that we are quite limited in the amount of focus and willpower we have as human beings. 
So we can choose to use it for a number of things. Now, this is, you know, when I go to companies or when I do coaching for people, I tell them, don't make too many changes at once. Don't. Because each change takes an, um, takes effort, takes resources, takes willpower. So what you want to do is you want to make changes gradually and you want to set up incentives around yourself to have, to get yourself into good mental habits. So if you have people around you who are problematic for you in some ways, that you, you will have to deliberately spend resources, willpower, to protect yourself from acting like them, because otherwise you will act like them. So you can't do that if you can you know, constantly think, hey, I don't want to be like this person, but I would strongly encourage people to just try to get out of those situations and know that those people are going to be draining for you. Mm, they mm, are going mm. to eat up your energy. So you're making a choice to be around a person. I mean, to the extent that you have that choice, you should try to choose not to be around that person. <laughs> right, right. No, I fully agree with that. I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, that's a Jim Rohn quote. He says, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I think that's been phenomenal for me to, to figure that out. I, I just, I don't, like you said, I love what you said before about how on a subconscious level or on an, on an automatic, no, automated yeah, level. Five. Autopilot, autopilot there we go. Autop I don't know why I'm struggling with that. I'm just sure. <laughs> autopilot level. You know, they're influencing you, and I think that's so powerful. And it's it's you can use this to for people listening to this recognize that I've talked about how to protect yourself from it, but you can put these things to your to work to help yourself. You can autopilot, like you can put your success on autopilot. You can put your fitness, your improved diet, all these better habits you want on autopilot simply by associating with another network of people. That will that will feed them to you. That will encourage you, right? If everyone's sitting around sleeping, I know when I first moved in, the teenagers they all sleep in till the afternoon, and so I was having a hard time getting up at my usual 6 a.m. Now that's not a problem because I've got a routine going and I've you know figured things out, and and we're all kind of established in the house now, you know. But when we first moved in, the first week, I was it's funny because because I was just doing what the teenagers did, you know, and it was just kind of an interesting thing. So I think you can do it again in any way. You can you can put yourself on autopilot to help yourself be more successful. Absolutely. Now, when you say we, we have, have a, li a limited amount of... Oh, sorry, yes, there's a thing that goes on in our lives, which is called decision fatigue. The more each decision that we make takes energy. So it's very wise to, to do what's called default. By default, I do this. Set up mental habits and routines that cause you to make good decisions and would structure yourself in advance. So you get your intentional system to create various default patterns that would lead your autopilot system to make good decisions through incentives. So this is what you're talking about. Create good habits for yourself so that you're not drained by making good decisions every time. They're just automatic for you. Right. Now, you, you said our decision-making and willpower is a finite resource every day, and I've heard this a few times. Is this something that you can you can strengthen? Is there is, like and I mean as far as what you know as the research shows, like yeah, okay, you can improve it, but is it a marginal improvement? And you're better off to make structural changes in your life as far as routines and habits and people you associate with, or are you able to just become a monster like you know that can deadlift five like a th these guys that deadlift a thousand pounds? Can you just build a, your decision-making power and willpower to an, I don't know if obscene is the right word, but to a surprising strength level compared to the relative human, or is it just marginal gains? Oh, you, you absolutely can. So you can definitely do it. And I strongly advise people to do it. This is kind of, so the intentional insights, uh, nonprofit that I run, this is about that. This is kind of techniques to build up your willpower. Now I, as part of that, you, can also and should gain skills in structuring your environment. That's part of building up willpower. I don't think of it as essentially distinct. Kind of, you want to do both. You want to build up your willpower, your focus, your decision-making skills, which are all distinct things. And you want to build up your skills in structuring your environment to help your autopilot system make good decisions in the moment. So building up your willpower and focus Things that are super helpful for that are meditation. So meditation, mindfulness, that causes you to build up your focus. And there are a variety of other techniques. So something like putting your hand in cold water, like ice water, 
has been shown to build up willpower. Wh- huh? So, what? Yeah. Yeah. Just holding your hand in ice water for a long time, as long as you can, builds up your willpower because you are deliberately causing yourself to suffer and that builds up your strength, your discipline. So, yes. That, yep. So, these are two quick techniques, you know, for mindfulness meditation. That's one. The other one that I would quickly recommend is that's both of these are research based, kind of building up, holding your hand in ice water. Anything that causes you discomfort and co- and where you overcome your desire to be comfortable, basically, I, I mean, the ice water is just an example of that. It's something commonly used in the research. Yeah, but no, that's fine. That's I, I'm yeah. thinking of CrossFit because there's workouts where I'm like, I could fall asleep right now. Like I've been, <laughs> I'm like exerting myself physically so much. I'm like, I could really just walk into that corner away from everybody and just curl up and pass out because I just get so mentally fatigued. So I hear that something. The CrossFit is not quite the same thing. So something, if you're deliberately causing yourself discomfort in a way that you can easily get away from, but you're not getting away from it. If you, so that is what I'm talking about. You know, for example, a common way I build up my willpower is not scratching itches, just like habitually an everyday level, just not scratching itches. You know, when I itch, I notice that I'm itching and I'm like, okay, I will wait until I'm uncomfortable enough that I need to itch. And that I will wait. So that's a very basic way of building up willpower. A lot of these things. Are. Got it, got it, um, got it. Well, I think... Making, yeah, for decision-making, kind of reading the stuff about the intentionalinsights.org and practicing these things of building up mental habits, of awareness of decision-making and putting in numbers in your decisions, that really helps building up in decision-making abilities. Mm, 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 mm. That's awesome. That's really powerful. So we've got all these. And so, again, it's a muscle that can be flexed and be used and exerted. The more you exert it, the better it gets. Are there any common things that people just and this might be too generic, but are there any things that people allow to happen that did like that depletes their willpower? Things like letting things slide like and like. I'm not, I guess I'm sorry if I'm trying to formulate the question better, but are there, you know what I mean? Like you say that there's small things like not scratching the itch, are there opposites to that where most people just allow it, but you're like, that's actually dangerous. Yeah. So uh, I actually had a mit- meeting with a client just earlier today and we're talking about people deal with business cards when they get business cards from others. And she was saying that she puts them in the stack and, you know, then she processes them and whatever and forgets them. And that's many people just kind of build up a collection of business cards. Now, what I do with business cards is I immediately put them into my contact sheet, contact list, and I throw out the business card. And what it is, that's an example of something that is a really effective technique to not deplete your willpower, because what happens is that these business cards and any other tasks that you leave hanging, they're still there in your mind somewhere. Ah. They're a loop that's not closed, and they're always to a little bit of an extent, draining your willpower. They're like, oh, I have to keep this thing on my mind and, you know, this thing that's not done. Uh, like, so that that is a drain on your willpower. And I make sure to minimize these drains. I make sure to structure my life. And I talk to my coaching clients about how to structure their life in such a way that they will minimize their willpower and energy drain for these sorts of activities. And any tasks left undone is going to be a willpower drain. Mm, 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 that open loop. Yeah, close yep. loops. Finish what you yep. start. Absolutely. I like that. I like that a lot. So where do people may tend to struggle the most or get caught up the most? Where, what are the biggest hanging points for people, for clients, as far as you see? Oh, the biggest hanging points? So there are a couple of things. One is for themselves internally is differentiating comfort and truth. The autopilot system does things that when we intuitively feel like we should do something, when our emotions tell us to do something, that feels very comfortable to us. That's kind of what the feeling is, comfort. Comfort is the feeling of our autopilot system doing the thing it intuitively wants to do. That's very different from what is going to be most impactful for reaching our goals, which is kind of the true thing that we want to be doing. That's the most effective thing to do. So whatever is most comfortable is very often not the most effective thing to do. So our gut reaction. So people have a lot of trouble overcoming 
their gut reactions and doing things that are, aren't comfortable that expand their comfort zone. <laughs> so this is one thing that clients tend to struggle with a lot, mm. doing things that are uncomfortable for them. So that's one. That's internally. Now, what they tend to struggle with with other people is well, what's called in the research failing at other minds. And that's a basic tendency to remember that other people are not like them. Hmm. So I'll give you an example that comes from me. So I'm an optimist. I have to constantly struggle with remembering that other people are not optimists, hmm. that other people will be more risk averse, that they will not be excited about new ideas and initiatives and be like, yes, let's go do them. Let's try this thing. They'll be like, well, wait, but what if these like 215 things go wrong? <laughs> you know, right. Right. And that's, that's the pessimistic perspective. Or another one, I tend to be more aggressive. So when I get the fight response, when somebody is doing something that I dislike, I tend to want to change the situation, you know, do something about it. So my, for example, right now, in, besides my business work, I am an activist for truth and politics and rational thinking in the political sphere. I'm writing a book called The Alternative to Alternative Facts, fighting post-truth politics with behavioral science. So this is something that I'm doing. I'm active about it. But there are other people who want to turn away from the news, who don't like the lies and deceptions, but who want to turn away from the news, who have the flight response, who are retreating from the situation. And it's not intuitive to me to remember these things. This happens very often with my clients uh, in businesses. I'm working right now with a consulting engineering firm, which has a staff of about 150 engineers, and they're trying to get these engineers to do marketing. Now, these engineers are not excited about doing marketing. Right. They, <laughs> yeah. They're engineers. Of, <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Now, these, these folks uh, try to get engineers to do marketing by providing them with training in how to do marketing. And then the engineers were still not doing marketing. They were like, well, these people are lazy. Why aren't they doing marketing? And they brought me in, and I'm saying, well, it's not because they're lazy. It's just they're not motivated to do marketing. They much prefer to do their techie engineering stuff. Right. So, kind of reframed it to the engineers to be about, hey, you can be thought leaders and you can get a reputation and respect among your peers if you go and write white papers and do conference presentations. And now engineers are much more excited about this stuff, which is the kind of marketing that the company wanted them to do in the first place because mm. I reframed it to be emotionally engaging to their autopilot system. Right. And then you tied a, a, a direct benefit to them into it. Yep, Exactly. So, now, how does this tie in with things like drug addiction or alcoholism and things like that? Is it the same? Because is it just – and this comes from a couple different levels. One, like I've got a friend. She actually works with Rehab Center in the U.S. And she started trying to – basically her role was to go on Facebook and to find people in all these addiction center groups or addiction groups. People talking, you know, all these free pockets of people and talk to them. And she said, you know, Daryl, I've kind of become a little bit jaded. I'm like, why? She's like, I don't think a lot of these people want help or to change. Because when we offer that, that we've got free services and paid services, they're like totally unwilling to spend any money on the paid stuff, even though it's less than they're spending on their addiction per week. Like they might be spending 100 bucks a week on their addiction. If they have to spend 30 bucks to get help to stop the addiction, they just – they don't seem to like, you know, they, they got to spend something, you know, like, so I'm just curious about any, any input on that. So generally with addiction, what you want to do is figure out why the people are addicted, what needs it satisfies, and then how can you replace those needs? So people, they're not necessarily motivated to pay for these things, pay for their replacements. It takes a lot of deliberate, intentional system reflection to change their addiction patterns. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is figure out what needs are being satisfied by the addiction and present the paid services as being more effective at satisfying those needs. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. And so then it comes back to the same fundamental principles as well. Frequent reflection, feedback, refining your, your decision-making and willpower skills on a daily basis, surrounding yourself with the right people that, want, you know, that are going or doing what you want to be going and doing, and just kind of, I guess, compounding it over time, essentially. Yeah, it takes, and before that, it takes willingness and motivation to change and knowledge about how to do so. So all of these things are going to be part of the 
process of change, willingness, motivation, and engagement. And then because the skills, you know, like the engineers who were given the training, you know, they had this knowledge after they were given the training, but they weren't doing the thing. It's not because they're bad people. It's because they weren't motivated. So you need motivation before all of that. Right, 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 right. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. So again, anyone that's listening to this, if you want to take a peek at his tip sheet for helping you make better decisions and get the ball rolling, it was Gleeb, G-L-E-B, at? Mm -hmm. Intentionalinsights.org. Intentionalinsights.org. That's awesome. Yeah. So I guess what do you see as the future of this industry? as far as helping people make better decisions, helping people develop more willpower. Are there any trends that you're really excited about? Are there things that you think are coming through the pipeline that will help make people's lives better? Apps or training mechanisms or what? Like, where do you see this, your industry in 5, 10, 15, 25 years? So a couple of areas. One is definitely apps. So the tip, tip sheet and guidelines that I mentioned, I also worked with a programmer to create an app based on it, which provides automatic and quick calculations. So people don't have to sit there and do the calculations themselves. And I see this as an important future orientation kind of apps and so on to do this. I see a future where companies, I mean, companies are quite excited about this. I just gave a nonprofits as well. For example, I just gave a presentation to about over a hundred nonprofit leaders in the Columbus area. And they are quite interested in this, integrating this into their activities. I see this as something that the government is going to be integrating as well into its activities. Uh, President Barack Obama in September 2015 signed an executive order to integrate behavioral insights into government policy. Mm. So I see that as another one in where things are heading. And this I see as a really important aspect of our future as the research comes through. So right now, I decided to be a person who is a science popularizer as opposed to focusing on the research because I see a huge need for science popularization. This is cutting edge stuff. As I mentioned, the list of cognitive biases is growing every month. There's kind of a new one added. And the research is very cutting edge and it's just going out into the public. I think people who adopt it right now are going to be at the forefront of reaping the advantages of this stuff and gaining the benefits from doing so. And so this is why I am trying to help folks do it as quickly as possible and as effectively as possible. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, I agree. So what are some of the habits, what are some other habits and rituals you have for yourself to help improve your decision-making and, and willpower? Do you have any daily routines? Yes. So some of the daily routines I have is doing meditation in the morning, and I do meditation that is both empty mind meditation, which kind of calms me down and distances me from the stuff that's really focus building and calming. Then I do a meditation that reminds me of the routines and habits that I want to have every day, mental routines, mental habits. Kind of, It's a sort of a checklist where I run through them in my mind. And checklists have also been shown to be very helpful techniques for people to use in decision making. So I do that. Then I have oh, I have journaling. So I journal daily uh, for in the morning, usually in the morning about the day before and kind of what I want to do in the day ahead. And there are various journaling things that I do. And then I do things like I, I begin each meeting with my nonprofit board by doing meditation, mindfulness to get us into that space. For major decisions, I always use these checklists and habits. So when I have major decisions to make within the nonprofit or within consulting and so on, I also do things like if I'm sending an important email, I let my wife, who's a pessimist, take a look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's a good way for me to kind of, you know, check various things and so on. And in general, when I have new ideas that I think are really excited about. I talk to her about it and she helps me bring my feedback on the ground. So these are sort of things that I do for my own biases, what I know are, are problems for myself. And I would encourage all of your listeners to try to figure out what biases apply most to them 
out of that list of over 100, what do they tend to engage in? And then correct for, the, for these biases themselves. Like I mentioned, for the optimism bias, I tend to leave about 50% extra time and more resources than I intuitively think I need for various projects. So it's kind of like a habitual thing that I have learned about myself and I can do that. Right, which makes all of a sudden makes your planning way more realistic. And it, it gives you a sense of proof of learning because you see the progress and you see that that rule proving true for you time and time again. So it builds your confidence in your ability to execute and achieve your goals and dreams, right? As opposed to constantly being frustrated that you can't seem to meet the goals that you're setting. Absolutely. It gives a better mental experience and more joy in life and more happiness. Absolutely. I was talking about goal setting and we're almost out of time, but I want to bring this up because this was something that I'm, I thought I was a big fan of goal setting and I knew a lot about goal setting. I didn't know there were three types of goal setting. There was, well, there was process oriented goal setting, objective based and, and performance based. And that was a big aha for, cause I've always just been an objective person. And then I started setting process goals because I just found it easier to guarantee success. And I have a growth mindset as well. So I'm always, kind, you know, um, so that's where I felt just naturally I cling to that. But for me, that was a big aha. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit? Because I think that would be important for the listeners. Yes. So for long term big goals, I always set process goals. So for the kind of life goals, for my meaning and purpose, I have process goals. I want a life of happiness, fulfillment and flourishing. And those are my process goals. I don't want to kind of reach certain things. And each of those I break down. So happiness for me means a sense of satisfaction and contentment in my daily life and occasional joy and pleasure. Fulfillment for me means fulfilling my values in relation to myself, my tribe, my group of people around me and my society. And then flourishing means wellness and thriving in all of my important life areas. So those are process goals. Within those, I might set some SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely goals, which would be specific projects, but they are subparts of this process goal. Right. And so a process, just to kind of help people, so a process isn't so much like the objective might be, you know, to whatever. I mean, people listen to this, it might be to grow a seven-figure business or to be a market leader, right, in their industry. That would be an objective or an outcome goal. But the process would be the day-to-day disciplines and weekly, monthly things that they would do as a regular – that may not get – you know, that are at least in the direction of the outcome goal but can't necessarily guarantee – it's like within their control. You might not be able to control what your competitors do. Someone might develop develop some new patented technology that nobody saw coming, and you can't control that. But at least you can control what you're doing day-to-day, week-to-week, right? Yes. So it's about focusing on things that are within your locus of control which is an important phrase that audience should remember. Kind of one of my favorite quotes is, you know, the idea of, well, what can, we can't control anything in life except for ourselves. We can only control our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. We can't control the environment around us. We can't control other people. It's only ourselves that we can control. And that's what's crucial about the process goal, kind of having control over ourselves. So we can't control whether our, competitor develops new technology, but we can control how many resources we are investing into developing new technologies and how much efforts we keep, you know, keeping track of other people in the industry to see what they're doing and so on. We can't control whether we will develop some new business clients. We can control how much networking we do to develop business clients. So kind of focusing on the things we can control, that's really crucial in these activities and focusing on things like, for me, happiness, fulfillment, and flourishing is the big overarching drives. So am I doing the things that will lead to my happiness, fulfillment, and flourishing would be the kind of questions I would ask myself in that sort of context. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Gleb, you've been so great and forthcoming with a ton of really valuable information. I definitely think this is a call that people will want to listen to again and again and again, just to make sure that they've got all these things. Anytime you feel like you're struggling with something or, you know, you're unable to, I just can't seem to focus and get what I'm done. I think this would be a great call to listen to just to remind yourself and make a checklist out of everything we've talked about here. Cause there's no magic room, right? I just, I love saying this and I just want to say again, there's no magic room, right? We're not going to hang up and you're going to be like, all right, Daryl, here are the real secrets, 
right? That like, you know, right? Like this is it. Like people just heard it. Like people, this is it. If there are things you want to change about yourself, your health, your habits, your behaviors, if there's loving family members that you want to take care of and see, be more successful, overcome their challenges. These are the fundamental bricks that will get them there. Is that correct? Am I? Absolutely. This is everything that we've talked about is the fundamental bricks that will get them there because decision-making impacts every aspect of what we do every day of our lives. Right. So now, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? No, I think you did a great job with the questions that we went through. I think you asked the kind of things that people would be interested in knowing. <laughs> well, good, good. So, Gleb, for people listening, if you want to get Gleb's tip sheet, it go to Gleb, G-L-E-B, at, forgive me, intentional... Insights.org. So, yes, email me at that email address. And then if you are interested in hiring me as a speaker, trainer, consultant, or coach, you can go to glebtsipurski.com. That's my name. You can just Google it. And that's G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y.com to check out the, my consulting and speaking. Then if you are interested in a nonprofit I run, which has articles and videos and podcasts about this topic of decision-making, go to intentionalinsights.org. That's awesome. So, Gleb, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a real treat. I know I enjoyed it. I'm sure the listeners will, too. Some people's lives too. will be changed from this. And so just thank you for taking the time out of your day and making the decision to come help <laughs> me and my listeners. I was really glad to be on the podcast. Now. Thank you so much. You've reached the end of our interview. Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give to them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you. So look, I was privileged enough to sit in the room the other day and uh, listen to, to Daryl present. I had the great fortune to spend some time with Daryl Abrinsky during this week and we had an incredible two and a half hour presentation with Daryl. Daryl is was amazing. I got so many little nuggets of wisdom. I hadn't heard Daryl speak before, um, but what, what struck me from his presentation was he is one of these hidden masters in the internet marketing world who has worked on some pretty incredible launches. Daryl has a ridiculous amount of knowledge. Daryl Abanski's presentation was absolutely great. I really loved it. An incredible knowledge of numbers. He is a very articulate, very knowledgeable, very advanced uh, marketer. Well, he talked a lot about um, yeah, keyword tools and how to research your niche. So it really created a lot of predictability around moving forwards in our business with the marketing and sales aspect, which is so important to any business to really see it grow. Where he walks you through step by step how to judge in detailed form how much money you could potentially make from a market based on AdWords, keyword research, and putting together quite complex uh, Excel spreadsheets. And what I took away from it is not only understanding your niche market, but also looking at and breaking down and going, am I working with the right niche? Is there enough demand there for me to be able to reach my goals? And doing that hard research. There's a lot of gurus out there um, that present you a lot of the why and the what, but they don't necessarily give you the how. And, and what I really found with Daryl's presentation, there's no holding back. There was no holding back the screens of the curtains, like everything was given to, to really assist us. His feasibility and due diligence is, is incredible. 
and he was able to show us in a really short space of time how to cut through the overwhelm. They're giving us the, the exact tools that we can use to test something before we before we even go to start testing it by spending money on it. One of the biggest nuggets that I got out of his presentation was that when people pay, they pay attention, and when people pay a lot, they pay a lot of attention. I just love that. I think that's a great way to look at how to price yourself. And he was a great speaker, lots of energy, and it was, it was really great to spend time with him. Honestly, phenomenal presentation. I would love to catch up with him, you know, next time I'm in this part of the world.